All right, Jess, take it away. Great. Thank you, Michael. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the FDA Stakeholder Webinar on the Draft Guidance for Industry on Action Levels for Lead and Juice. I'm Jessica Rowden, the moderator for today's event. During our webinar today, we will provide an overview of the draft guidance on lead action levels for juice, as well as answer some stakeholder questions. First, I want to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Susan Main, the Director of the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, will provide opening remarks. Dr. Paul Stout, Director of the Division of Plant Products and Beverages in the Office of Food Safety at CISTAN, will provide an overview of the draft guidance. Dr. Conrad Chouanier, Director of the Office of Analytics and Outreach at CISTAN, will speak on the Closer to Zero initiative. Following our speakers, we will have a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment you would like to submit, please email us at the closer to zero at fda.hhs.gov email box. That is closer, the number two, zero, at fda.hhs.gov. With that, let's begin with remarks from Dr. Susan Main. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I am glad we have this opportunity to present and answer some of your questions about our draft action levels for lead and juice guidance for industry. This draft guidance supports our broader efforts to reduce exposures to lead, arsenic, mercury, and cadmium from foods, and advances our goals in the Closer to Zero plan to reduce exposure to toxic elements while maintaining the availability of foods that provide nutrients essential for growth and development. This is among the agency's top priorities and has been an important issue for the FDA. Our approach to this work follows a cycle of continuous improvement that starts with evaluating the current science, analyzing sampling data, and advancing research to develop interim reference levels. The interim reference levels, or IRLs, are among the key factors that the FDA uses to inform the development of action levels. Our draft action levels for lead and juice represent this approach and are guided by the FDA's IRL for lead. In addition to IRLs, we also considered exposure and risk assessments, detection and quantification capabilities, and achievability. We are confident that the science-driven, transparent, and inclusive process will help lead to further reductions in exposures to toxic elements. This approach has led us to these proposed action levels which, if finalized, would represent the most rigorous standards for lead and juice in the world. Equally important to our process has been broad stakeholder engagement, including working with our stakeholders to assess achievability and feasibility of the proposed action levels. Our stakeholders, including parents and consumer advocacy groups, public health professionals, the food industry, federal partners, academia, and other stakeholders are vital to our successful efforts. We are committed to ongoing engagement with you throughout the process, and this is the reason we are here today. Stakeholder engagement has been among one of our top activities this past year and we are thankful for your ongoing support and input. We have met with industry stakeholders as well as numerous professional groups over the past year, and we plan to hold more public meetings, webinars, and workshops to exchange information, disseminate knowledge, and encourage implementation of practices to reduce the presence of these contaminants in foods. These meetings help to further highlight those areas where additional research and data sharing can help us build the scientific basis necessary to develop and revise action levels moving forward. In addition to stakeholder meetings, FDA has taken a whole of government approach by collaborating closely with our federal partners, as well as our state and international partners to better understand associated health effects from exposure to these elements and the ways in which industry including growers of the commodities used in baby foods, can achieve lower levels of contaminants in their food products. We are working closely with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, including work to identify good agricultural practices and collaboration on nutrition-related issues. 
In late April, we held a public meeting with USDA to discuss agricultural issues, such as potential strategies to mitigate the uptake of toxic elements in crops. We are also working in collaboration with the USDA Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC, on coordinating our messages for consumers and to ensure that critical information, such as the importance of eating a varied diet, reaches this audience. In early April, we participated at the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture workshop on Closer to Zero and discussed various research topics, including soil chemistry, and main sources of contamination, plant uptake and accumulation of toxic elements, and practices to limit bioavailability of toxic elements in food products. We are also working with our other federal partners, including EPA and NIH. We are currently collaborating with EPA to evaluate the science for arsenic, to jointly address environmental mitigation efforts for lead, and to provide joint advice to support families in eating seafood lower in mercury. And we are working with the National Institutes of Health to address research gaps on the toxicological health effects of toxic elements and the role of nutrition for mitigating the impacts of exposure. Reducing levels of toxic elements in foods is complicated and multifaceted, and we could not do this work alone. We are committed to ongoing work with our federal partners industry, and consumer and health advocates on our shared goals of reducing consumer exposure to toxic elements from foods. Our combined efforts have already led to meaningful reductions in exposure to toxic elements from foods, and we are dedicated to advancing this even further. With that, I would like to thank you for your time today. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Paul Fowle, who will give, give us an overview of the draft guidance on action levels for lead in juice. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Main. Uh, again, my name is Paul Sal. I'm a division director in Sif Sands Office of Food Safety. Um, in the next few slides, I'd like to provide an overview of FDA's draft guidance uh, issued on April 27th. Um, And, and provide an overview. Um, again, this includes action levels for lead and juice. Um, and just some background information, uh, toxic elements like lead exist naturally in the environment, but are also present due to human activity. Uh, because they are found in the environment, um, toxic elements like lead can also be found in food. Uh, juice can be contaminated with lead from sources such as produce used to make the juice. Uh, old lead-containing equipment, um, but also through other pathways such as uh, filter aids, for example, uh, like diatomaceous, diatomaceous earth or past use of pesticides. Lead is toxic to humans and can affect people of any age or health status. Lead is especially harmful to vulnerable populations, including infants, young children, pregnant women, and their fetuses, and others with chronic health conditions. Also, nutrient deficiency can result in vulnerabilities. Even low lead exposure can harm children's health and development, specifically the brain and nervous system. Uh, neurologic effects of lead exposure during early childhood include learning disabilities, uh, behavioral difficulties, and lowered IQ. Uh, lead exposures have been associated with immunological, cardiovascular, renal, reproductive, and developmental effects. FDA is committed to reducing lead in food to the extent feasible. FDA's Closer to Zero Action Plan um, is a science-based iterative approach to decreasing toxic elements such as lead in foods over time, including by setting action levels as we are proposing. Um, the action levels for lead and juice in this document would, if finalized, replace the current level of 50 parts per billion described in the guidance for industry uh, juice hazard analysis critical control point hazard and control guide. Um, FDA considers the action levels uh, in this guidance to be achievable by industry when measures are taken to minimize the presence of lead. Uh, 
Uh, this table outlines the two action levels that are being proposed in our draft guidance. Uh, the first category is apple juice, and the proposed action level is 10 parts per billion. Uh, the second juice type is fruit and vegetable juices other than apple, and the action level is 20. Um, here I just want to note um, that this, the action levels are applicable uh, to single strength or ready to drink uh, juices. Um, also, I note for the second category, uh, this includes juice blends that contain apple juice. Uh, just some background. In 2001, the Codex Alimentarius established a maximum level of 50 parts per billion for lead in ready-to-drink juices and nectars in international trade. Um, the Codex Alimentarius Commission is a joint FAO a WHO program. Uh, this was established back in 1963, and they formulate voluntary international standards, guidelines, and codes of practice. The FDA has participated in Codex for decades. I note uh, we do participate in the committee on uh, 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 the Codex Committee on Contaminants and Food. Uh, Lauren Robin is currently our U.S. delegate. In 2004, uh, FDA adopted a 50 part per billion as the recommended level not to be exceeded for lead and juice in the FDA juice has of guidance. Then from 2015 to 2018, Codex lowered maximum levels for fruit juices in general. Uh, this was from 50 to 30 parts per billion and also lowered uh, grape juice and small uh, grape juices from 50 to 40 parts per billion. In 2018, FDA developed an interim reference level uh, for dietary lead to replace FDA's provisional tolerable total daily intakes from their early 1990s. In 2021, FDA initiated the Closer to Zero Action Plan that identifies actions FDA will take to reduce exposures to toxic elements, including establish, establishing action levels for food. In response to codex actions, as well as FDA's development of IRLs and the Close to Zero Plan, FDA reevaluate the 50 parts per billion lead level recommended in the current juice HACCP guidance. And this slide addresses our approach. Um, I do note, in addition to the draft guidance document that's posted online, there also is a supporting document that provides details on the approach. Um, uh, what we reviewed was toxic element program, uh, TEP, and total diet study data sets. Um, in, in review, we looked specifically at total, uh, uh, the toxic element program data uh, for use for what we're calling exposure and achievability assessments. Uh, the reason why we didn't use the TDS data sets for the exposure and achievability assessments is because total diet study samples are uh, composite samples from three different samples uh, that are collected, and, and therefore that is uh, uh, almost like an average. So we decided not to use these TDS samples. Nonetheless, we did review the data from the TDS. Um, in regard to the different assessments, for the exposure assessment, uh, FDA compared the concentration of lead in juice um, as well as dietary exposure. Uh, the dietary exposure, uh, we look specifically at NHANES survey data. Um, two lead from juice for children with and then without the action level. We also did an achievability assessment uh, to assess achievability or, or manufacturer's ability to achieve the action levels that we're proposing. FDA determined the percentage of juice samples that fell at or below the proposed action levels of 10 parts per billion for apple juice or 20 parts per billion for the fruit and vegetable juices other than apple juice. Uh, we do note that FDA issued a lower draft action level for apple juice because it is the most commonly consumed juice that young children drink. Uh, this slide provides a summary of the data that we, we reviewed. Uh, the first data set, the toxic element, uh, program data. This is part of FDA's compliance program. 
Uh, we looked at fiscal years FY 2005 to 2018. Um, and again, the TEP data was the data we used for the exposure and achievability assessments. Uh, the number of samples we reviewed were, was 1,640 samples. Um, again, we also looked at total diet study uh, data. Uh, again, we did use this for the achievability or exposure assessments, but we did review these results in regard and, and looked at them in regard to our, our proposed action levels. There were 643 samples uh, from the TES. Um, this slide provides uh, some of the information that we looked at uh, and, and developed based on our achievability and exposure assessments. Uh, the first uh, uh, column is the different types of juice. Again, we have the apple juice, and then the fruit and vegetable juices other than apple. Uh, second um, is, is the uh, proposed action levels of 10 and 20. And then the third column is the achievability. Um, looking at the different percentages, if we applied the 10 part per trillion action level, we saw that for apple juice, 95% uh, could achieve uh, that 10 ppb action level. Um, then looking at the fruit and vegetable juices and other apple, um, we found that 97% uh, could achieve the 20 part trillion action level. Uh, moving across, uh, scenario A is where we apply no action level. Uh, here we're looking uh, specifically at the data, uh, no changes to the data. Uh, looking at apple, we had an estimated mean lead concentration of 2.4 ppb for apple juice. Uh, and then for the um, fruit and vegetable juices other than apple, we found 2.9 um, ppb for the mean lead concentration. The estimated lead exposure from juice, um, this is for zero to six-year-olds um, for 90th percentile. Uh, we used a 90th percentile because this is uh, for what we consider uh, uh, heavy consumers or rather high consumers of, of the different juices. Uh, we found uh, that children to consume uh, a rather estimated lead exposure of 0 0.79 micrograms per day for apple juice. Um, and then for the category on fruit and vegetable juices, a 0 0.78 micrograms of lead per day. On scenario B, where we apply the action level, and, and real briefly, what we did with the data set, uh, for example, for the apple juice at 10 ppb, uh, we excluded uh, all those samples that were above the 10 ppb. Uh, we found that estimated mean lead concentration dropped to 1.3 parts per billion for the apple juice. And then for the fruit and vegetable juices other than apple, um, the level was 2.4 parts per billion. Uh, we also estimated lead exposure from juice for the 90th percentile. Again, this is for zero to six-year-olds. We used NHANES survey data, um, and then we used 90th percentile because of those are, are, are consume high uh, intake or high users or high consumption for juices. Uh, we saw uh, 0 0.43 for micrograms of, of lead per day uh, for the apple juice, and then 0 0.64 micrograms per day uh, for the fruit and vegetable juices other than apple juice. So looking at the last column, looking at reduction um, in exposure at the 90th percentile, we saw a 46% reduction if we applied 10 ppb action level for apple juice, and we saw a 19% reduction if we applied a 20 ppb uh, lead action level for the fruit and vegetable juices other than apple. Um, in summary, um, FDA is accepting comments on the draft guidance through June 28th. Again, this is a 60-day comment period. Um, we do accept comments after that time, however, uh, so that your comments are used in, in uh, looking or reviewing our draft guidance and so that they will be included in developing the final guidance, we do um, uh, recommend that you do submit comments by June 28th. Uh, we also note that a manufacturer may choose to implement the recommendations before the guidance becomes final. Um, we are planning to work with manufacturers of these products to encourage the adoption of best practices to lower levels of lead in juice. Um, and, and I do know we do routinely monitor levels of toxic elements in foods and consider 
Um, these on a case-by-case -case basis to determine whether a food um, that contains a contaminant is adulterated under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Um, with that, um, thank you for your, your attention. I know that we have questions at the end, uh, but from here I'll, I'll hand it over to Conrad Schoenware to uh, provide an update on Closer to Zero. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and thank you all for being here today at our webinar. Um, I'm Conrad Schoenier. I direct our Office of Analytics and Outreach at the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. As you know, many juices are commonly consumed by very young children, so the proposed action levels that uh, were, uh, Paul just went over will help us advance the goals of our Close to Zero plan, which is to reduce early childhood exposure to lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury through foods to the extent possible. Uh, these are elements that exist naturally in the, in the environment, but are present from man-made causes. Uh, and so, expo and, and exposure to these contaminants at very early ages has been shown to have impacts on development. Uh, given their presence in the environment, uh, zero exposure may be difficult, if not impossible, but our aim is to incrementally reduce exposures over time. To do this, we are following a cycle of a continual improvement where we first evaluate the current science to develop a reference level, use that reference level to guide the development of action levels for, for specific foods and categories of foods. We'll propose those action levels and get input from stakeholders on what is achievable and the feasibility for making reductions. Then we'll adjust and finalize those proposed action levels based on the current science for managing contaminants such as practices growers can implement to reduce contaminant uptake, steps manufacturers can take to reduce the contaminants in their foods, or nutritional aspects about the food that we might consider. We'll be monitoring progress, watching changes in levels of contaminants in foods to see if they've changed over time, as well as exposures among children. We are routinely sampling, uh, and we will take actions when warranted, uh, as we continue our research and collaboration with federal partners and other stakeholders. At some point, uh, we will start the process again because science will continue to develop and we'll learn more about whether and how we can reduce exposures or reduce the impacts of those exposures through nutrition. We'll be reevaluating that information in the future and adjust our reference levels as well as our action levels as appropriate. As mentioned by Dr. South uh, and Dr. Main, Today's action levels were guided by the interim reference level for lead exposure from foods that FDA developed in 2018. This level is based on CDC's reference level for lead in the blood of children. CDC updated their reference level in later 2021, and so we will soon publish an update to our interim reference level. We are evaluating the science in order to develop reference levels for arsenic and cadmium. Uh, and we are con uh, currently sampling and analyzing the broad spectrum of foods marketed for babies and young children. Next slide. In the next few slides, I want to go uh, give you an update as to where we are uh, with respect to what we committed to back in April of 2021. So for uh, the evaluation, uh, in, we have been spending uh, a lot of resources evaluating arsenic. We uh, held a public meeting in November of 2021, uh, as well as uh, co-hosted a colloquium with the Society of Toxicology in early December. Uh, there was, uh, the colloquium was specifically focused on arsenic, but we heard a lot about arsenic in the public meeting as well, where we got a better understanding of how prenatal exposure leads to reduced uh, fetal growth and increased childhood infections as well as better understanding about how nutrition can influence arsenic toxicity. We are coordinating with EPA, who is now leading a development of a dose response analysis for a variety of health outcomes related to arsenic exposure, including pregnancy-related outcomes and neurodevelopmental toxicity. Uh, their systematic re review and analysis will help inform our development of our own interim reference level for inorganic arsenic, which we hope to establish in the next year or so. Uh, we have proposed action levels today. We're uh, proposing action levels for lead in juices. Uh, however, we have drafted guidance proposing action levels for lead in other categories of foods intended for babies and young children, and that is currently undergoing 
interagency re review, and OMB uh, for final clearance. We have, for consulting, we have met with numerous stakeholders in industry, both manufacturing and agriculture. Uh, in ad we've met with advocacy, academia, and state and federal government. Uh, our plan is to continue to meet with all of these stakeholders and get input on various aspects, such as the feasibility of achieving the action levels we propose, learn, learn about mitigating uptake of the contaminants and commodities, minim minimizing and reducing contamination during processing and the manufacturing of these products, uh, as well as the role that nutrition can play in blunting the impacts from exposure. We have also worked in the international arena. We have uh, representatives that work with our Codex Alimentarius. Uh, they have been working to update the code of practice for lead. These are best practices for reducing contamination in foods. And we will share that when, when that work is complete, and we'll share that with all of our stakeholders. Next slide, please. Uh, entering our second phase, uh, we are actively engaged in the evaluation of cadmium. Our toxicologists, epidemiologists, and risk analysts have taken an integrated approach to looking at cadmium. We've completed a scoping review for cadmium exposure and children's health effects. We've conducted a systematic review of human and animal evidence characterizing the adverse health effects associated with cadmium exposure. And we have been developing mathematical models that can help us understand uh, the just a, a, a dosimetry and reverse dosimetry. We hope to bring all of the scientific information to our FDA science board, uh, ideally this fall in 2022, uh, to have a public discussion of the work and to get input from experts about impacts of cadmium on childhood health outcomes. We have begun work in mer on mercury. As you may know, mercury the primary source of exposure to mercury, particularly methylmercury, is through seafood. So we will be engaged in scientific evaluation of mercury uh, and beginning, and we will have some announcements uh, in, the, in the next few months about that work and provide more details about we, what we are planning. We are committed to proposing uh, action levels for arsenic uh, in certain categories of foods consumed by babies and young children uh, once we have established that interim reference level. Uh, given our progress on cadmium, we are hopeful that we will also be able to establish an interim reference level in the coming year so that we can uh, propose some uh, um, action levels for cadmium uh, well in advance of what we had previously committed to. Uh, so we will um, continue to do our consultation with stakeholders on these issues uh, as well as finalizing our lead action levels that we're proposing today, as well as the ones that we hope to release in the coming weeks uh, for other foods uh, in a very timely manner um, as, as indicated in our timeline. Uh, we have work uh, that we are doing in uh, drafting some guidance for industry on hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls for human food, drafting a chapter specifically on chemical hazards, as well as toxic elements that we're discussing today. Uh, and we will soon be publishing data from our sampling, uh, as well as our total diet study uh, and exposure assessments later this year. Next slide, please. And then we have work uh, on phase three, which will be a continuation of most of what I've already stated, so I don't think I need to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. Next slide, please. In the coming weeks, we will be releasing data from our total diet study. Uh, this is a long-term study which collects and analyzes foods uh, from across the United States, uh, a representative sample of foods from the U.S. diet that helps us understand trends and exposure to contaminants as well as levels of contaminants in the foods. Uh, it also assesses levels of nutrients in foods. Well, we recently completed a multi-year update of the TDS, including improvements to the sampling design and analytical methods. Uh, and we will soon be posting the toxic elements data for the 2018 to 2020, 2021 sampling period. Next slide, please. You've heard today nutrition is a key factor in the Close to the Zero plan. While nutri nutrient support growth 
contaminants can work in the opposite direction. Ch children without adequate body stores of nutrients can be at greater risk of um, exposure, of the impacts of exposure. However, children whose diets align with the recommendations from the dietary guidelines are more likely to have adequate nutrient status and could be physiologically better prepared to ward off effects of these contaminants. So with these action levels and others to follow, FDA will provide information for consumers to help support them in making nutritious, choice, sort, nutritious choices while also limiting exposure to toxic elements. From our data, we understand that many children overconsume juices as uh, compared to the recommendations of the dietary guidelines for Americans and underconsume whole fruits and vegetables. Following the recommendations on juice consumption can have additional reductions in exposures to lead. Next slide, please. FDA is not working alone on this issue. Uh, we uh, will continue our robust collaboration with USDA, focusing on the issues uh, that we covered at the USDA public meeting in April, such as agricultural, nutrition, and economic issues. We will expand our collaboration with other federal partners, such as EPA, CDC, NIH, as we work through the scientific issues, including scientific issues related to the challenges in communicating about this issue with stakeholders and consumers. Next slide. So we look forward to your ongoing support and engagement on this plan. Uh, we look forward to the comments. Uh, we encourage submission of comments to the docket for the JUICE action levels, proposed action levels, uh, and we look forward to getting any data and scientific information you have to help inform our decision making. Thank you. And with that, I will pass this back to Jess. Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chouinier. Uh, we will now have our question and answer session. Uh, we have a panel of, that, of uh, subject matter experts that will answer your questions. Dr. Chouinier and Dr. South are joined today by Dr. Kelly Casavale. She is a senior nutrition advisor in the Office of Nutrition and Food Lab Labeling at CIFSAN. So we received a, a, a range of uh, questions on a number of topics in advance of this webinar. While at this time we may not be able to answer all of the questions that we received, we do encourage everyone to submit comments to the public guidance document. Uh, as was mentioned, please submit these uh, questions and comments to, to the docket by June 28, 2022, to ensure that the comments or questions and any other relevant data and information are considered before we begin developing the final guidance. So let's go to our first question. Um, the question is, although this is non-binding, will this action level be considered by FDA when determining recall class? Uh, Dr. South, I'll hand that one to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, and it's just a good question. Um, again, this is a draft guidance, so it hasn't been finalized yet, so we are uh, requesting comments uh, on that. But uh, when we do you know, review comments and, and uh, look at the, the science, and, and, and finalize the guidance, and including the action levels, uh, we would use the action level in determining uh, regulatory action, um, as well as other factors uh, on, a, on a food or a level of lead and, and juice. Um, I, I do note, um, in regard to recall, recall class, there are specific guidelines on recalls, um, and that is based on a, what's called a health hazard evaluation. Uh, so we would uh, use a health hazard evaluation to determine the, the recall class, um, but nonetheless, some of the safety information that's included in developing an action level would be part of, of, of the, uh, the health hazard evaluation. Thanks. Great, thank you. The next question, can you provide an update on timing regarding closer to zero on finalizing heavy metal limits and dates to be implemented? Can ad additional clarity be given beyond the posted timeline? Dr. Schwanier, do you want to answer that? Sure. Um, as, I, as I just mentioned, our goal is to finalize guidance documents in a timely manner. Uh, the timeline for fa finalizing each of these guidance documents as they come out will be con contingent on several factors, uh, including the number of comments we received or the amount of data and information that might 
uh, influence the decisions related to finalizing those action levels. Uh, our draft guidance, as I mentioned, the draft guidance on action levels for lead in foods intended for babies and young children is undergoing interagency review, and it is our hope that we can issue this soon. We are working to develop interim reference levels for arsenic and cadmium and hope to have those uh, reference levels established sometime in 2023 so we can have action levels for both of those contaminants po uh, proposed in late 2023 until sometime in 2024. We have received additional resources that uh, we are using to hire new staff uh, purchase equipment and other resources needed that can help us facilitate this work so that we can issue action levels for those contaminants ahead of the time frame that we published in April 2021. Great, thank you. Um, and before we go to the next question, I do want to remind everyone, all of our participants, that if they do have any questions or comments, they can submit them to the closer to zero address that's um, on the screen, closer to zero at sda.hhs.gov. Um, so we have another question, um, Dr. Swanier, I'll hand this one to you as well. Does the modeling used to establish the level in juice correspond to the latest blood lead reference value of 3.5 um, micrograms per deciliter? So this is uh, in reference to the CDC blood lead reference value. Uh, they recently reduced it from 5 micrograms per deciliter to 3.5 micrograms per deciliter. When we, uh, um, the approach we used to establish or propose these action levels in juice was guided by the older CDC blood lead reference value of 5 micrograms per deciliter because our interim reference level that we had established in 2008 uh, and our proposed, what we uh, anticipate to be our updated interim reference level, we did go back and check uh, that our approach uh, uh, still was concordant with the new reference level and our approach remains unchanged by the recently reduced blood lead reference value. Great, thank you. The next question. What is the collection protocol used to obtain the juice samples? Dr. South, would you like to take that one? Sure, thanks, Jess. So um, as I mentioned in, in, um, in my slides, um, there were two sets of, of uh, 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 juice samples, one through the total diet study and then one through the uh, toxic element program. So in, in regard to the achievability and the exposure assessments, uh, we use the toxic element program samples uh, for those reasons I think I outlined during the presentation. Um, for, for the collection uh, protocol for toxic element uh, program, because that is a compliance program, it is um, uh, described on, on the FDA website under compliance program guidance manual. So there is, a, I think, a link uh, there for, for that information. Um, but uh, real generally, we do have what we call uh, annual uh, sample food collections, um, which are, are uh, basically say for juice samples. Those would be distributed throughout the country to different districts, um, and then we would have FDA uh, district uh, staff collect samples, and then they would send those uh, back to district uh, laboratories uh, for analysis, um, and then the information would be. Uh, input it into um, our, our, our computer system for, for, um, for us to uh, take out and, and, and analyze. So, um, but nonetheless, there is a specific protocol for collect, collecting uh, juice samples or food samples um, and, and for analysis as well. Thanks. Great, thank you. Our next question, has the widely accepted findings of the protection against neurotoxic activity of background levels of naturally occurring heavy metals that is provided by other elements, for example, selenium, or evolutionary protection, been incorporated into this guidance? I'm going to hand that one to you, Dr. Casavale. Okay, all right, thanks. Um, the answer to that question is no. So research shows that some nutrients do interact with heavy metals. However, more science is really needed to better understand these interactions. And more importantly, in this case, the degree and variation of protection that they 
provide. So at this time, we don't um, have enough information and we're not able to actually quantify the counter counteracting effects that nutrients may have on heavy metals, although we know that those situations do exist. And so right now, what we're working towards is to evaluate the toxicological and nutritional science together to help us really begin to better understand um, what's going on there. Great. Thank and, you. And if I can just, if I can sure. build on that, 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 that is the reason why we have this cycle of continual improvement, because our intention is to revisit the science on a periodic basis. Uh, and one of the aspects of the science is the nutrition science and how does nutrition play a role here. And so as we get more information uh, on this in this space and we are able, if we are ever able to quantify, then we can take that into account when we uh, update reference levels and or action levels in the future. Great, thank you. Okay, our next question. Has the FDA or any other agency found methods for at-home testing of foods and juices? Do parents have the ability to submit samples for lab testing of similar ingredients found to contain heavy metals? Dr. South, would you like to take that one? Oh, sure. Thanks, Jess. Um, FDA hasn't, we haven't evaluated these, any home methods for testing lead in food and juices. Um, you know, Lead levels generally are quite low, and, and um, so, but nonetheless, I don't believe we, we've ever looked at those specifically. Um, also, um, we don't look at labs where um, of, of the public could submit samples. Um, so, so unfortunately, we, we don't have that information. Thanks. Thank you. Our next question. Has the FDA considered development of action levels for other heavy metals and juices? Has the FDA considered other populations vulnerable to heavy metal exposure, such as older adults? Uh, Dr. Schoenier, would you like to take that? Sure. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of my presentation, juices are commonly consumed by very young children. Uh, and so as part of the Close to the Zero plan, we are considering the presence of other heavy metals in juice and are considering development of action levels for those other contaminants, such as arsenic, cadmium, and mercury uh, in juices uh, in the future, as well as in other foods commonly consumed by young children. We do consider other vulnerable populations. Uh, we have an interim reference level, for example, uh, for women of childbearing age. Uh, and uh, when, we, uh, uh, when we identified very young children as a vulnerable population, uh, we generally presumed that uh, actions that were protective of that population would also likely be protective or beneficial to all segments of the population, including older adults. Uh, so we do believe that these action levels will have a benefit to all uh, populations. Great. Thank you. Another question we received is, does FDA have additional information on the samples, such as country of origin or brand name? Uh, Dr. South? No. Um, we currently posted the, the results for the, the different juice samples and the, the different types of juices, um, including the lead levels. Um, but um, we, we did include that information um, in, in regards to the country of origin or, or the, uh, the brand name. Um, but again, FDA does have that information. We do, we do collect that when we um, collect samples for the toxic element program. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, another question that we received, what factors prevent the FDA from setting limits by children's serving size for all commodities akin to the recommended daily allowances approach as opposed to by individual commodity like juices. Dr. Casabell, would you like to answer that one? Sure, yeah, sure. So FDA is not undertaking labeling regulations as part of Closer to Zero, um, but I do want to mention that similar to the recommended daily allowances mentioned in that question, and those are amounts of nutrients um, per, in per day um, amount, FDA does look at total exposure. Um, 
And so it's actually one of the first steps. So for example, we establish what we call interim reference levels, or IRLs. And those are really a benchmark for total daily exposure in micrograms per day. And then we can use that to help estimate stand, stand the potential contribution of individual foods or categories of foods to a total exposure from food. So, and along with other information, this informs the action levels, like the draft levels for juice that we're discussing today. So, our guidance to industry provides limits for concentration of lead in juices um, in the unit of parts per billion or micrograms per kilogram. Um, but it also considers the interim reference level, which is in units of micrograms per day, similar how to the recommended daily allowances are a total amount of a nutrient um, per day. Thank you. Um, another question that we received uh, was, will FDA establish a specific method for analysis or will we keep the same method that has been used? Um, Dr. Falk, would you like to answer that one? Yeah. Um, well, currently we, we do have uh, methods that we use in our laboratories. Um, um, and I think currently we use um, uh, the extra, uh, uh, IC EMS analysis procedure, I believe it's EAM 4.7. Um, I, I don't believe, you know, we're going to require specific um, uh, methods based for this guidance document. Again, you know, we would, um, you know, when we have requirements for, for uh, analysis, I think we, we consider, you know, what are uh, uh, methods that are comparable. But uh, all I can say is that we do have methods ourselves, and, and I, I think we would just we would look at comparable methods as well. Yes, we have information on our, our web page uh, for the analysis that we use um, internally. Thank you. Our next question: What other products will the FDA provide lead guidance on? And what other heavy metals will be a concern for the food industry? Um, Dr. Swanier, I'll, I'll pass that one to you. Yeah, so Closer to Zero is committed to setting action levels for lead, arsenic, cadmium, and mercury. Uh, and these are on foods that are commonly consumed by babies and young children. So we have, today we have juices, but what uh, the, the guidance that we hope to have uh, come out soon will be for those foods that are intended for babies and young children. Great, thank you. Um, our next question, are other toxic element data available for juices and for other foods? Uh, Dr. South, would you like that, to take that one? Yeah. Um, so in regard to juices, we, we do have data for other juices um, from the Toxic Element Program, also for TDS. Conrad mentioned that uh, TDS is planning to uh, uh, post some, some additional data sometime soon. Um, but for Toxic Element Program, we are putting together some data for, for, for arsenic, um, uh, for, for cadmium. We also are, are pulling some information in regard to cadmium as well. Um, for, for mercury, um, some of the... We don't, we don't have, have as much uh, data specifically for, for juices um, in part because uh, mercury is, isn't generally an issue for, for, uh, 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 for juices. Um, but nonetheless, you know, our toxic element program as well as TDS do look at other foods other than juices, so, so there is uh, data available for those. Great, thank you. Um, and I, there's another question that came in that I uh, will hand to you, Dr. South. Are the action levels for lead also applicable for juice-containing beverages such as lemonade? Yeah, actually, um, that's a really good question. Um, the, these action levels are specifically for juice, and so um, they, they wouldn't necessarily apply to, to uh, say, lemonade, uh, where a lot of the um, the beverage is, is made up of water. Uh, nonetheless, um, whether or not we have an action level or not, uh, we do look at uh, contaminants, uh, chemical contaminants in food, including toxic elements. 
a lemonade, we would uh, use some of the same information in regard to uh, the, the level found of, of a toxic element and then uh, consumption uh, for the uh, uh, different population, the vulnerable populations, as, as well as um, uh, uh, consumption data to determine whether or not there's a, a, an issue. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Dr. Sal, for that clarification. <laughs> um, okay, then the next question we have, uh, did you consider how other published studies, for example, consumer reports studies, study might have influenced industry behavior and thus uh, led in juice concentrations? Um, Dr. Schwanier, would you like to take that one? Sure, thanks. Uh, uh, no, we did not. Uh, consider those other published studies. Uh, this guidance is based uh, solely on the data from FDA's Toxic Elements Program, our compliance uh, program collected data between fiscal year 2005 and 2018. Uh, and so only that data were used to develop the exposure assessment and achievability assessments used to inform the action levels. Um, however, we do encourage all stakeholders to submit data and information to the docket by June 28, 2022 so that we can consider uh, that information before we begin work on the final guidance. Uh, we may also consider additional FDA uh, data when developing that final guidance. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, here's another question we got. I think this is a, a good question that probably a lot of consumers have. Um, so, uh, Dr. Casavale, I'll hand this one to you. We serve a variety of 100% juice three times a week. I am concerned, should I stop serving the juice? Yes, that, that is a good question, and I imagine on the minds of a, a lot of um, individuals who uh, either parents and families or, or those who work in early care and education settings, um, school lunch and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I think this kind of question, you have to consider the age of the children and also the amount of juice that you're serving three times a week. So fortunately, the dietary guidelines for Americans do provide recommendations for juice. Um, infants who are children under age one year actually are recommended to not consume any juice. And for older children, most of the time, they should have whole fruits instead of juice. Um, and the reason for that is that whole fruits have fiber that children need to stay healthy. Um, but juice is a relevant source of some nutrients for children. Um, for example, vitamin C, which is an antioxidant that we're all familiar with probably, but it also helps children absorb iron. So vitamin C increases iron absorption, and that's an essential nutrient in child development. So when children older than one year do have juice, it should be 100% juice with no added sugars. Um, it also should be a small serving. You know, consider something like four ounces or less a day. Um, and you can also serve juice mixed with water, which reduces the calories per volume. Um, as you may have seen in Dr. Schwanier's presentation, we have an FDA webpage. It's titled, What You Can Do to Limit Exposure to Arsenic and Lead from Juices. And it has some more tips that you could go check out there. Um, and for planning meals for children, either for families or for um, in school settings, I, I also want to recommend that early care and education centers and parents can use myplate.gov. Um, there you can get a MyPlate plan, which will describe the amount of foods from the food groups that can fit into a healthy diet. And so just remember that no more than half of the fruit recommendations in that plan should come from fruit juice per day. So thanks for that question. Great, and thank you for that information. Um, okay, our next question. Um, Will the FDA check just ready-to-drink juice, or will we also check concentrates? For example, if the FDA found 11 parts per billion of lead in concentrate, how will FDA proceed, considering that the concentrate is not juice ready to drink? Uh, Dr. South, would you like to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, actually, uh, when we collect samples of juice, uh, a lot of times they aren't ready to drink. Um, uh, because a lot of, of, of juice is concentrate that is um, is uh, transported around the country or, or at, at import. Uh, so we do use, um, based on, we, we actually look at what's called the BRICS, which is basically the sugar concentration. Um, and then we have um, basically a way to convert uh, the level BRICS to a, a ready-to-drink um, uh, 
um, basis. And then so there is actually, I believe our CFR does have a, a table on juices and there is actually a labeling CFR, a labeling uh, CFR in the CFR that talks specifically about what juices uh, need to be at um, uh, in regard to bricks. So we do that conversion and then um, we determine uh, exactly how, um, how much lead would be in that product. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, our next question uh, is a question about the data. So I will um, pass this one to you uh, again, Dr. South. Why include data from 2005 to 2007 when this encompasses only nine samples? Um, yeah, well, I guess what we did, we used all the data that was available after publishing the, uh, the two, in 2004, the guidance for industry, the, the hazard control guide for, for juice HACCP. Um, so uh, again, you know, we didn't want to um, bias any, any, any of the information. We just collected the data that was available. Uh, and, and so that's why we included those. Again, it does, you know, the, that's only nine samples. But uh, again, I guess at that time, we weren't uh, sampling juice as much as we are now. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, I have a, another question. Um, why did the FDA report limits of quantitation vary, reported limits of quantitation vary so much? What was the influence of these LOQs on the action level? Uh, again, I think that's one for, for you, Dr. South. Yeah, and that's a good question. Um, again, we, we have different labs throughout the country. Um, and uh, depending upon what instrumentation they have, um, um, it, it could be uh, um, flame atomic absorption, spectroscopy, uh, coal vapor atomic absorption, spectroscopy, ICPMS methods. And each of them um, have different um, LOQs. Um, and even the same instrument, you could have a different LOQ. Um, so that, that's probably, you know, and again, I think we collected samples over a number of years. And so technology does change over the years. You get different instruments. Uh, again, we try to update our instruments in the labs to be, um, you know, basically to be more sensitive because levels, uh, we're more interested now in lower levels. Uh, so that's probably the reason why levels have, have gone down um, in, in regard to the LOQ. But even in the same year, you do have uh, different uh, instruments at our, district, our different district laboratories. Um, but we, we, we have uh, conducted an assessment. Uh, we saw the same thing in regard to LOQs. Uh, we did uh, conduct an assessment to understand the influence of, of high LOQs on achievability estimates. Um, and, and we did determine that uh, samples with high LOQs and, and zero values had little influence on the achievability estimates. So, but nonetheless, that was a, a good question. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm looking at the time, and I, I think that is all we have time for today. I do want to thank our, our speakers and panelists um, for, for their participation, and I want to thank all of our participants for the great questions that they provided and for attending today's meeting. Again, we do encourage everyone uh, to submit comments to the, the public guidance docket by June 28, 2022. Thank you all for attending. This concludes our event for today. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you.